Deborah, thank you so much for being here. I'm so, so excited for you to be in the podcast. How are you? I'm very well. And thank you so much for inviting me. It's lovely to talk with you again. Yeah. And, t- and say to people where you are uh, talking to me from. Uh, I'm in London, South London in England. Yeah, if people already didn't figure out by your lovely accent. <laughs> Thank you. Because <laughs> it's one of my favorite accents. Um, you know, oh. just a side thing that when um, I passed by London, when we were going to, I think when I was going to Jordan, and I just loved while we were there waiting for our other flight, and I was on this magazine things that sell, you know, magazines, water, whatever. And I just saw this family of these kids and I just got to make, I just want to be close to them so I can hear them talk because I thought it was so <laughs> cute then talk with a British accent. <laughs> like, no, mommy, could I have this magazine? It's <laughs> like, yes, please just talk more. I just want to listen. <laughs> it was funny. The first time I went to New York, which was, oh God, I don't know how many years ago, 30 odd years ago, um, I had to take a taxi and I got in and I said, uh, can you take me to where it said, and he said, oh, fine, said, just keep talking to me. I love, I love listening <laughs> to you talk. And he in fact didn't charge me for the ride. It was, oh my, my God. first introduction to New York cabs. That was amazing. <laughs> oh my God. And, and I, I believe that saved you a lot of money. So that Probably, is fun. Yes. That is fun. <laughs> So Deborah, you are author and you are also a coach. So Mm -hmm. tell people about what you do, which is a fascinating uh, way because you help artists. So I, and that's why I'm excited for you to be here. So tell me a little bit about what you do. Uh, Well, I'm a coach. It's like life coaching, but I work Mm -hmm. very specifically with creative people and it just has kind of narrowed down to artists um, because uh, something that I've seen a lot, I, I work backstage, if you like, or in administration of lots of arts organizations. Mm-hmm. And the thing that I saw was that people were so incredible at their creative side, mm-hmm. but they were held back by their mindsets, mm-hmm. um, either their own things like their own confidence or by the stories that are told, like you can't make money as an artist Mm, um, or artist, being an artist isn't really a proper job. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, all that. That one is a lot. (laughs) Oh yes. And, and artists who say, Oh, I can't possibly charge people for my Mm. art because I love doing it. Mm. Which throws up all kinds of, you know, issues around money. Mm -hmm. Um, Oh, you should only get paid if you hate what you do. Mm. Mm. That's an interesting thought. But, you know, and and one of the things that I saw, particularly on the kind of um, the, if you like, the business side, the practical side of Mm -hmm. being a professional artist, is that uh, there was a lot of conversation about, oh, I can't do that because I'm not Mm -hmm. business-minded and that kind of thing. And so one of my aims is to show how the the way that you think as an artist can be transferred into the way that you do everything else Mm -hmm. and also the way that you approach life Mm -hmm. generally can be, um, you can use those skills as an artist to run your business now I'd be very clear I'm not a business coach so I couldn't tell Mm -hmm. somebody you know how to do their figures or how to you know register for their tax or stuff like that but Mm -hmm. it's just getting people to think that I mean this is a simple one that I use in a workshop which is uh if it's a a face-to-face workshop Mm -hmm. we used to have those um I used to say to people think about how you got here today you made the decision to come here you put it in your diary. You worked right. that you had the fare to get here or the petrol money to get here. You worked out the route that you were going to get here. You do that all the time. You do it every time you walk out of the front door to go to the shops. Well, in a very simple way, those are exactly the same skills that you need in order to run a business. You need to know when, where you want to get to as an right. artist. Uh, you need to put a roadmap in place. You need to work out, you know, how much money you need, stuff like that. I mean, this is simplifying it hugely, but even just getting people over those steps of going, oh, well, I know how to do that. I know how to work out, you know, have I got enough money when I go shopping today? That kind of stuff. So budgeting, Mm -hmm. it's those sorts of skills. And these are things that stop people a lot. 
And also this whole question of um, what is success? Mm. And, you know, people look at what other, other artists are doing, think, oh, that's what my career should look like, rather than why do you create? What is yes. it that's important to you as a creator? Is it to, to spread joy? Is it to educate people? Is it to make people think, you know? And how do you want to be known in the world? You know, some people want to be famous and rich and fantastic, go for it. Mm -hmm. But others want to be earning enough money to keep doing what they're doing. Right. Some want to use their art because they've got a particular message they want to get across, whether it's about, you know, climate change or gender or, uh, you know, all those kinds of issues. Yeah. Um, and so it's about finding out what it is that you want to do. And I kind of believe that most people know what it is that they want to do in the world, mm. but it gets so buried by your parents telling you that isn't a proper job, mm. yeah. by society saying you've got to be earning lots of money, that's what success is, by, yes. um, oh, I can't possibly do that because people like me don't do it. You know, all the oughts and the shoulds and the stories – and when I'm working with people, it's fascinating because I usually work with people for a minimum of six sessions. Mm -hmm. And they come to me at the first session saying, this is the thing I want to work on over the six sessions. Mm -hmm. And we start working on that. And I ask lots of questions and find out what they really like doing and what might be getting in the way. And then sometimes about three or four sessions in, they'll say, actually, the thing I really want to do is, and that's when this big dream comes out. Mm. I've created the space, which is non-judgmental. If someone right. says, you know, I want to have a piece of my work in a major museum, I don't go, really? Seriously? You? Um, I go, okay, so how, how do you right. think that could happen? What, who do you think you might need to know? What do you think, you know, it's pulling all this information out of them, getting them to find their answers as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how your book became about when you, you so you have a book, uh, Why You're Not Succeeding as an Artist. Yes. Right? Yeah. And, and that's how your book came about. You decided, okay, I'm work with this artist and I'm seeing the same patterns and I'm going to write a yeah. book. Well, it was funny, really. I had been writing lots of blog posts on my mm -hmm. website. Mm -hmm. And alongside that, I'd also been... Uh, going networking and I met another coach who was doing health and wellness mm -hmm. uh, Joanne Henson her name is and she had decided to bring out two books one on what's your excuse for not eating healthily and what's your excuse for not getting fit if you want mm -hmm. and so she created this kind of format where you have these the question and answer if you like and she had she got different authors to write about different subjects and I think she had done about eight before mm -hmm. she said to me have you thought of doing one about art like I went no I hadn't really because I'd never thought of writing a book but the mm -hmm. way the format of it was so perfect for the way that I write because I don't write great long academic things right I write in a quite conversational way I like nice yes um, kind of I like things that people feel when they read an answer, they'll go, yeah, I could do that. That feels accessible. That feels, it's, a, it's not like, um, okay, here's how you change your life in the next three months. It's, here's one little thing you could do, play with this, try this out. And then if they do that, they think, oh, if I could do that, I could also do that. And the other great thing about the format of the books is that, when you open them and you look at the contents page, mm -hmm. you see all these different excuses, which are right. a lot of excuses that yes. come from clients, yes. which I have, to be mm -hmm. honest. And you, the first thing you do is you look at those and go, oh, I thought that was only mine. I thought I was mm -hmm. the only one who used yes. that. So yes. immediately you feel, oh, this is a, hopefully this is a yeah. safe space. I actually got the book on Kindle and you're, you're, you're right. It's very easy to read. I read it really fast. Mm -hmm. But I had so many highlights here on my Kindle. <laughs> <laughs> I love but, that. But I, I wanted to say to people that we, in this episode, we're not going to go deeper inside the book because I'm going to do an exclusive uh, 
episode just with the book as I'm going to do several books that I love and that I think it can help us and we go deeper on that and we're going to talk more about that in the other episode but I just want to say to people if you want to start reading the book um, I'm going to put of course on the notes but I want to just say about one highlight here because as I said I have many (laughs) but you said whatever is your background your insights and instincts are as a distinct as your fingerprints and and as this individuality individuality and uniqueness is what fuels your unique creative talents we all benefit if you use those talents to help us to see the world in a different way mm. i think that was so profound because i think what we as artists have to start to think is i think we are today thinking too much of others instead of what we have and not giving value on what we have because it's our hands it's our background it's our culture um in me i i believe that i bring of course a lot of the latin flavor Mm -hmm. to my because i i cannot help it it's just how i am and I think that is um, something that we, I see people struggling with that. Uh, don't you agree that today, and I was actually recording a, a podcast yesterday that I was a guest and we were talking about this, that people are not, they are using, so I believe actually social media is really good. I don't mm-hmm. believe in all this evil thing because I believe that social media is going to be what we let social media be. Mm-hmm. But I think many people are using, are letting, so not using, but letting social media put them down yeah. or the comparison or thinking, wow, I'm never going to have 10,000 followers, but, and why this is important. Exactly. Um, so I think that is preventing people to actually have joy. Absolutely. I think that's so true. And it's, it's, I'm going to be completely honest and say it's it's a trap that I fall into sometimes. You know, we all have days when we're a bit off and, and you look at someone else doing something, you think, oh, they've got it all sewn up. And you think, and you, it, it's remembering to take that step back and go, first of all, we only show the best of ourselves on social media. On the whole. Yes. You know, I don't show you the, the post that didn't work or right. you know, the days when I don't put the makeup on or whatever. Um, and it's so it's kind of false from that point of view but it's it's, a parallel world right it's It's another world world. and it's I think it's about each of us bringing and I'm not saying we all have to turn up on there just looking rough or whatever but it's about being authentic so it's about posting what is true for us what we want to put across rather than trying to be um I mean I look at other coaches and I think oh I should probably make these more slick or that more slick or whatever but that's not me if I put that out like that then people come to me they're going to Mm -hmm. see there's a there's a dissonance they're going to think oh well actually she looks all slick on the website but when I talk to her she fluffs her words or you know when I Mm -hmm. get overexcited I tend to tumble my words together you know and stuff Mm -hmm. but that's part of who I am and I think it is about the only thing that we have that we can absolutely depend on, I think, um, is our uniqueness, is that thing that, yeah. um, and we all think we're like our friends because we're in the tribes. But I think about my best friend who's about 10 years younger than me. And sometimes I make a reference and I can see it goes completely over our head because even yeah. though we have kind of similar backgrounds, we're just that different in age. So we yes. all have these different interests, these different bits mm-hmm. of information, these different reference points. And mm-hmm. different experiences, right. you know, and it's 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 not necessarily about just sitting and talking about them all the time, but it's just being aware that these things make us who we are, mm-hmm. you know. Are I mean, you talked about your your Latin background, you know. Mine is is very, you know, sort of lower middle class, white, English. That's who I am. I can't mm-hmm. get away from that. Mm-hmm. So how can I embrace that? Use mm-hmm. that as well as being appropriate to everyone else around me, you know, not mm-hmm. saying well, being white, white, lower class British is the best. It's definitely not. It's one of many things, but it's about using that thing that is absolutely you and bringing in all those flavors into mm-hmm. the world. And, you know, you will see the world in a completely different way 
to, to the way I do, even though, because I know we've spoken before, we do have lots of values in common. We do yeah. have lots of ideas in common, but we have that background. And so, um, and, and looking at your, your art, I, I, I don't consider myself to be an artist. I, am, I consider myself to be a doodler. So I, I do things just purely for my own well-being. And I look at your work and I think the way you, you, your flowers are so beautiful and they're completely different to the way I would do flowers. They're, mm. they're stunning, yeah, the colours are exactly. amazing. And you think about, I mean, you, if you walk into an art gallery, you know, that, that has a group show and you think all these people are using more or less the same materials. Yes. I think about it particularly, I love going to um, jewellery shows Mm. Um, you know where people make you know the bespoke jewelry mm -hmm. because I just it's again it's the creativity and yeah. I can stand there where I can see maybe about you know 15 different stands around me and I think all these people are using different yeah. gold and silver perhaps two metals and even but sometimes you see the same beads but you know some pieces are you know some beads in in jewelry are very famous and people use them a lot so yeah. but it's totally different it yeah. is, and, and that's what we want. We want that um, that kind of, um, you know, when you kind of think, oh, I've never seen, I've never seen it that way before. But why do you think that sometimes people want to be like the other person? They want to deny their uniqueness. I think sometimes it's being fearful. I mean, I think fear is at the bottom of a lot of mm. things. It's that fear of not wanting to, to stand out. It's that fear that the other person's got it right and you haven't. So therefore you've got to, to follow them. Now, I should say, I am a great believer in looking at what other people are doing and learning from that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But from the point of view that of- That is essential in the beginning, yeah. Absolutely. And even sometimes as you go on, I see mm -hmm. coaches doing things Mm -hmm. And I think, oh, that's quite interesting. And I always liken it to, to kind of, I think this might, I've put it in the book somewhere. I think it's about like trying on a jacket mm -hmm. where you've seen somebody else in a jacket. You thought, oh, that's nice. And you try the jacket and think, oh, well, that doesn't quite work. Well, I quite like mm -hmm. the sleeves, but I don't like the collar. So you take out the bits that work for you. Yes. And so you play, it's not like I've got to, you know, I've got to cut an arm off so it's, coat actually fit right me. i saw actually an interview of elizabeth gilbert that uh -huh, wrote the big yes. magic with marie folio on youtube marie folio mm -hmm. and it's not a new interview but somehow facebook um youtube you know put as a suggestion for me i said mm -hmm. oh i didn't know she had a, a interview with marie folio and it was actually an amazing interview, of course, because she's just amazing. It was, I think, when she was launching Big Magic. Oh, it's and, great book. and she said, kind of what we're talking about, and you talked about, she said that there is no creativity without fear. Absolutely, yes. You yeah. have to go through that. And she also said there's nothing new in the world. Yeah. The only difference is that you give your flavor. Exactly. exactly. And I was like, yes. It's because so her true. book is pretty much all about that kind yeah. of like saying there's nothing new but it's about your uniqueness and yeah, yeah she has some woo woo things in that book but yeah. <laughs> um but again it's, it's about the essential of the book is this you you have to have fear but you also have to believe in your uniqueness yes that nothing is new everything was done in a certain part of the world at, yeah. at one point yeah and and i always think this when it's interesting when you go with a friend to, you know, it could be looking at art, it could be you've both read a book, the same book, or you've seen the same film. And you say, oh, what do you think about? Oh, well, I liked this bit. And you, you have the different bits that you like, but also you say, oh, I thought it meant dot, dot, dot. And you can have mm -hmm. totally different meaning, meanings out of the same thing. Yeah. And we sometimes can be frightened of having that different opinion, but it's just an opinion built on, everything that you've experienced and learned and and it's important because it, it's like you know I know we're going to talk about my book in another session but just using that mm -hmm. there are lots of books out there that are self-help yeah. books that are, mm -hmm. and I think it's and I've got I've got lots of them in the bookshop the bookshelf behind me mm -hmm. and I think sometimes I can read them and I think oh I think I read that 
kind of idea in another book but I understand it better this time because of the way it's been communicated yes yes because of the way it's been written and so that's why it's important even if you think well I kind of do work like other people do but you've got your own emphasis on it and you mm-hmm. can make us see something different and, and it's a we all yeah, and I also books. and I also have to say to you I don't think there is a lot a lot of books for artists are there in the terms that your book is and some few books like Big Magic. Mm-hmm. Um, there is not a lot. There's a lot about creativity that doesn't particular is for, for artists. There is creativity about, I just bought a book actually, it's a dancer, but she wrote a book about creativity. Is that and, kind of pop? Yeah. I, and, I, I, I love that book. <laughs> yeah. Somebody said that was uh, great. So I, I bought it, but I think your book, it's unique in terms of, I've never seen a book. I mean, I can be wrong. Of course, there's millions of books out there. That is very to the point. Oh, very to the point and, and clear, you know. But one question that I have about your, you know, the people that you talk with, do you help people that just, they want to be a professional artist or Sometimes it's just people that they don't want to, but they have this fear of creating. Is that all, all kinds of people? It's, it's all kinds of, I always say, um, I kind of say I work with creative professionals, but sometimes I work with people who have another profession, who mm-hmm. want to keep that profession, but for whom the art is really important. Ah. And they don't want it to be something that, you know, they don't, it could be that it's something that really nourishes them and something which also helps them deal with that other job. Mm. You know, they might have a job they enjoy, but it's quite stressful. Yeah. Um, and so the art is something which is a, a release from that. And also, yeah. And also through doing the art, um, it's because they're thinking in a completely different way. It sometimes gives them ideas for their, if you like their professional job mm-hmm. um so it's about getting in touch with that creative part of them i sometimes work with people who um are uh, kind of what i would call like corporate professionals you know they mm-hmm. have that sort of corporate life but who think in a creative way and so they they like to come to me because uh, you know, they. In, I, I always send a pre-session questionnaire, so before the session, just to get them in the mood, thinking what they want to be talking about. Mm-hmm. And and I have one client who always sends me back um, mind maps and slide decks with images because that's how she thinks best. So because she thinks creatively, she can then kind of brainstorm with me and then put that into her corporate world. Mm-hmm. Um, people who are perhaps I'm getting a few of these at the moment. People who have gone through the pandemic they might have been furloughed or they might have been working from home who are now going I'm going to have to go back to that job Mm. and I don't know that's what I want to do because actually I always wanted to be you know an artist or a writer or so they're coming Mm -hmm. to look at do they just not go back to their job or do they do they think well maybe I will start you know doing my art a bit more seriously on the side and maybe in two three four five years time I will go more professional with it so it's people who are uh, really getting in touch with that creativity as um, sort of more than a hobby Um, and I'm not saying that in a dismissive way about you know art as a hobby Mm -hmm. I think that's absolutely valid but who want to take it perhaps a step further or make sure they're making time to do this or they're realizing that that creativity from painting or drawing or writing is actually an essential part of who they are which makes the rest of their life better Mm -hmm. Um, as well as the professional artists who um i guess the key kind of clients if i'm thinking about it are People who may have been to art school about five or six years ago and they kind of came out of art school with a a bit of a whoosh and did really well, but Mm -hmm. have now realized that they perhaps haven't quite built up the networks or they're not quite sure what the next steps are. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of women, particularly who are um, the kind of empty nesters, they've been doing their art alongside Mm -hmm. being either 
as a as something for themselves or as a very low level kind of career mm -hmm. but who have now got space where the children have gone and they're now going okay it's my turn now mm -hmm. and they're not necessarily well some of them want to be hugely successful but some of them just want to say no this is who I am now I've done the mm -hmm. wife and the mother and I'm always going to be that mm -hmm. but now it's my turn to use all this life experience um to try, to try. that level and people who have just I think the biggest thing is change um, I think that's what sends people to coaching is they think that or they feel that something needs to change. And sometimes they know what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, I've always wanted to do that and I've never quite made the leap. Or I first came to coaching when I went to a career coach and I was a fundraiser mm -hmm. and I needed I wanted to change my job. And all I could see was going to the next level of fundraising, which I had never wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I went to a career coach thinking I'm, I'm trapped. I, I use that word a lot at the time. I'm trapped in this career I never wanted to be in. Um, and I don't know what to do next. And kind of what happened was obvious in that there were lots of questions asked and things like, well, you have these transferable skills. You can use them there or there, which you don't see because when you're in that kind of trappedness, you, you can't think clearly. So it's the objective thinking that's so valuable yes um and so it's, it's often people just think i'm not in the right place but i don't know where the right place is or i know what this project is i want to do but i just something is and they need that help mm -hmm. and they need help and what i offer is a safe space so people can mm -hmm. say what they think they can put those what they might think oh, this is a really stupid idea but they've got somewhere to say it <laughs> where they're not going to get laughed at yes where we can talk it through right um, we can find out that I'm an objective listener. Mm -hmm. But it's not like talking to a friend where, for instance, you might think, mm -hmm. um, you know, what I'd really love to do. I'd really love to go to, I don't know, New York for a year to, mm -hmm. to see if I can make my career work there. Now, if you say that to a friend, they may be supportive, but at the back of their mind, they may be thinking, but yes. what happened to me <laughs> for that crazy. year? Yeah. <laughs> I'll be on my own. And, you know, and so I come to it with a, okay, so what, if you went to New York for a year, how would you do that? What would mm -hmm. that mean? What would you get? More realistic, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's, it's kind of being a, um, I use all kinds of words. It's, it's a thinking partner. Mm -hmm. So I can throw ideas in. It's an objective, isn't it? It's a cheerleader, you know? So mm -hmm. when someone says, oh, you know, my, my coach, when I worked, my career coach, my very first conversation was I was I said I'm applying for all these jobs and I keep getting down to the last two and then I don't get the job and she said well congratulations getting down to the last two candidates and I went yeah and then carried on talking she said no no you got down to the last two that's really good and so I can do that for people I can get them to see you know see where the winds are and how can you build on that mm -hmm. um, yeah and and also when you were speaking before and I I kept that thought on my head because I didn't want to um, interrupt you, but you were saying that sometimes in session, people say things that they will never say or they, yeah. you know, and yeah. I think that's true because I think it's the same validation because I did therapy um, uh -huh. for a long time and I will continue to do this because I moved. So I'm, I'm still arranging things, but I think when you have a, the psychologist or a coach or a social worker, whatever they are, I think people open up because you are a neutral person. And that's yeah. why I think therapy so, or coaching, whatever you, you want to do, is so fantastic. Yeah. Because actually, my therapist, my last therapist, he didn't used to talk a lot, but yes. I talk a lot. <laughs> and then with my own thoughts, I arrived at my own conclusions. I would sometimes say to him, okay, I just had an aha moment right now. <laughs> I, I had a session once where um, it was an hour long session and I sat down with the client and I said, so what would you like to talk about this time? Mm -hmm. And she said, well, I'd like to talk about it. And at the end of an hour, I then said, so, okay, here are the actions you've come up. And she basically just did a, a, 
a, a train of thought for an hour of, oh, and if yeah. I did that, I could just, and I didn't interrupt because I could see she was working it out. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I jump in and pick up a point or if I, you know, or I'll ask a question to, to pull something out more. But I think a lot of it is, it's about being heard because often yes. when we're talking, the person we're talking to, and yes. I do this as well when I'm not in coaching, is you kind of go, oh, 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 I've got something to say to that. So we're waiting for them to stop talking so that we can mm -hmm. put our point in. And in mm -hmm. coaching, it's it's my job is to create. But a also, way. you know, the person's not going to judge you. Exactly. Because the person's not that to judge you. Exactly. The person is there to, and I also love to talk about, you know, and a person that is totally neutral because they're going to see things different because exactly. they are not with you every day. They just yeah. really are seeing the point of your thoughts and how you can get out of it. Because many mm. times my psychologist told things to me and he said, what are you running from? And I was like, yeah. me? Yeah. No. And I start thinking about it. I, okay. <laughs> I never thought about this way. Let me think for a second. Yeah. Huh. You know, and when, when you're at he, the end of it, it's all If, if he was a friend, he would never say that to me. No, he would never no. see that point. No. Or maybe he would see that point, but he would never say to me. I mean, yeah. if you are very bland, I'm a kind of friend like this, I say. <laughs> but oh, I know most of people, they don't want to hurt yeah. your feelings and exactly. um yeah. and and it's i tell people if you have the opportunity the other thing that i do that i think is amazing and if you are in that level that you want to grow as an artist i do critique sessions um, mm -hmm. with a coach and to me i know many artists have a fear of that yeah. and but to me it's essential because she knows where i want to get which I want to get, not that people want to get, not things that maybe will sell. No, I know in my mind what I want yeah. and to grow. And I think that it's important someone says, and when we say critique, I think people already have fear. Yeah. <laughs> what are yeah. they going to say? And it's about, for example, she told me last, last week we had one and she said, well, I can see something here. You were doing that thing again. Yeah. You keep doing that. So your homework is to do this and this because yeah. I see you stepped way better now, but you have to step out of the same thing that you're using yeah. here. Yeah. So, and I was like, huh. <laughs> and then I look at our sketch that I did and I showed her, see, I did the same thing on this end. Yep, you did. So yep. let's let's branch out a little bit. Yep. Um, it, it's true. I think and it's that, important, right? To have is, that other yeah. eye. And, and I, I, another phrase I use about what I do is critical friend. So mm. I'm on your side. I'm always on your side. And that doesn't mean that I will just go, okay, that's fine. That's fine. No, sometimes it means that I will say, exactly as you said you're doing that thing again or I notice you always say that I, I had a client who within about a 20 minute session or 20 minute segment was saying about things she'd been saying to other people and she said oh and this person said they really liked it which I was in, which surprised me because I thought they didn't like me and she said that phrase I thought they didn't mm -hmm. like me about three times in 20 minutes and I was mm -hmm. able to then go you've you've said this i'm just saying this back to you this is what you've said would what what let's do a, a vital like, katie here is yeah. that true <laughs> yeah I, what what makes you say that and it made her realize that she always assumed that people wouldn't like her mm. and so she kind of went into things just slightly aggressively because she was like getting she's being defensive and well if you're not going to like me I, I don't care sort of thing and as soon as she realized that and she kind of allowed herself to soften up a bit more amazing what our thoughts have... can do oh god yes that's amazing yeah. I I'm sure you know Byron Katie and yeah I a couple of years I think I, I started to see her work and of course I started with Eckhart Tolle but mm -hmm. 
he's a little deep sometimes. Yes. <laughs> and when I found Byron on Katie, it was just so simple. But at mm. the same time, I was like, oh, do I have to ask if my father is true? Is never true? <laughs> this is that's so that is absolutely it's, it's, it's interesting and i i ask people I'll, I'll put a link of her she actually has a free worksheet that you can do the ah, work yourself she calls yeah. the work but she has tons of videos on youtube yeah. and the funny thing is that not funny but the process is is that true and already gives you yeah. that yeah. but then she has again is that really true yeah and it's yeah. amazing when you watch on her youtube how people are like saying what you're saying. He did that, and he's like that, and he did that, and I thought that. And she asked, is that true? And the person, yeah, it's true. <laughs> I, and she says, well, meditate about it, what yeah. it just said to me. Yeah. And then she waits a little bit. Is that real true? Yeah. And, and they are like, no. But you can see their faces like, wow. Because we, I we, just put yeah. myself in this torture when in yeah. reality it was not true at all. I created all that. Exactly. It's, I mean, in simple terms, it's like when we send, you know, maybe you send an email to a gallery to say, would you be interested in my work? And you don't hear back. And we tell ourselves, well, they hate my work. Mm-hmm. I'm never going to be able to work. I'm not professional enough. And actually the person was yes. on holiday and forgot to put their out of office on. You know, sometimes it could be that simple. But we, but in that uh, moment, you, your work yeah. is not what they're looking for. Because especially guys, they go through kind of themes or, you yeah. know, phases. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. We tell ourselves things. It's kind I mean, of a job it, interview, right? Yeah. Sometimes you are you have other credentials, but they say no, yeah. but because maybe yeah. for that particular part, you are not, you know, yeah. what are they looking for? Not that I you are not credential, you have all the credentials. Exactly. And we forget that it's our work. I say our work, because I think about it as a, as a coach as well, because I'm not a coach that would suit everybody. And that's something I have to live with, you know, is, mm-hmm. is that. And it's not like, oh, well, I'm a bad coach. No, I know there's a lot of people who I'm not the right coach for, but the people I work mm-hmm. with are, you know, it's exactly right. And it's the same with art. You know, if you think about it as yourself as an artist, you can appreciate other people's work, even if you don't particularly like it, even if you think I wouldn't have that in my home because mm-hmm. it would work with me, but I can admire it and I can appreciate it. Mm-hmm. But we, we take these things so very personally. And part of it is because particularly with artwork, it is, it's coming from yourself. It is your baby. Yes. Literally. So of course it's going to be hard to, to take that. Yeah. Step I out. think that's but what it, makes this kind of work. Yeah. Hard. The mental work hard because it comes from our heart, our soul. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, and I'm here when I'm, um, for you, the listeners is we are not just talking about painters, but we are talking about all mm-hmm. kinds of art. Like if you write a book, if you're a writer, yeah. oh my gosh, that really comes from, yeah. you know, within you and your thoughts and your hearts. Um, if you are a fiction writer, oh my God, you create all this exactly. world and, and stories and it's, it's fascinating. If you are potter, you know, you do pottery and things like that. I think we all have similar struggles. Yes, because we are artists and everything's very emotional. Absolutely. Um, and, yeah. and so it is going to hurt when someone says, mm, it's not my kind of thing. It's like, oh, that's an arrow to my heart. And you're just going, OK. And at that point, it's it's that being able to just take a breath. Mm-hmm. And just go, OK, thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you for for sharing. And then just going, okay, it's not, it's not personal. But the problem is uh, that we tend to then we take it on board and then we build it up. And mm. I mean, you know, they always say that if you ask an actor, they can never tell you their good reviews, but they can tell you the bad one. And they can yeah. usually tell you every single word of the bad one. I, I do a lot of, well, before the pandemic, I did a lot of public speaking you know, workshops and stuff like that. And I don't know how many workshops I've delivered and I can kind of remember the feeling of that wonderful satisfaction of delivering a good workshop and knowing it's worked in a kind of a vague way. But I can tell you every single detail of the two hours of the workshop that didn't work. <laughs> but because, you know, that's, we remember the negative yeah. and part of it is, um, 
it's kind of a safety thing. It's mm. a kind of our brain going, remember this so that it doesn't happen again or so that you can protect yourself. It's, it's like, you know, if you put your hand on a flame, you only do that once because right. then you go, oh, I remember that hurt. I remember, yes. oh, you don't do it again. It's the same kind of thing, but we tend to forget that, oh, okay, let's learn that lesson and move on. We kind of, I don't know what it is about, about us as humans, but we tend to hold on to these negative things and believe that those are the truth. And then if you, the, the thing that I find even more frustrating is that when it works, it's a fluke. Oh, well, I, I, it was obviously just a good day or it was a better audience. Why? Yeah. No. Celebrate, remember yeah. that who you are. Uh, something I think that helped me a lot in what you're saying is so true. And I think the way we can get out of this is just if in that moment that things are wrong, we teach our brain that it's okay to continue yes because I think I learned this in, with my son because my son is autistic and mm -hmm. since young age we've been working so hard on simple things that many parents take for granted right mm -hmm. when you have an autistic child you everything you have to teach several for times mm -hmm. sometimes for years like for my son to get party trained it was years and the thing that I learned is that not get frustrated because mm -hmm. you just have to do it again and do it again and do it again. And today, when I see him, he's 12 today. Yes, he's still having shoes. He's still learning. There's still things he's learning. There's always things to learn because when you have a development disorder is you grow and you need new mm -hmm. skills and it mm -hmm. takes years, right? Mm -hmm. So, but today when I see him going to the bathroom, washing his hands or doing his laundry. And I was like, wow, you know, or eating because there's a, a time in his life that he had severe issues for mm -hmm. e eating. And it's like, I think he taught me a lot about my brain never should have said, okay, I'm, I'm going to stop because he's never going to learn, right? Yeah. I, yeah. There was a moment actually that I, I remember clear when he was very, very young thinking oh my god he's never gonna say mommy oh and being sad about it but mm -hmm. that didn't make me stop trying for him to mm -hmm. learn how to speak I think that taught my brain okay he's not but we have to keep going because he has yeah. to learn and if he you know completely because you know some autistic individuals they don't speak at all mm -hmm. they end up not speaking but I always, I, then I started to think, okay, but if he doesn't, I, instead of being, okay, that's it. Mm -hmm. I thought, okay, but if he never speaks, I'll find ways for him to communicate a device or something. After I free myself from that thought that he never going to speak. And I gave another solution. We actually started to work hard and he ended up started speaking. Yeah. And yeah, he's not going to have conversations with you, but he can tell us what he needs. He can say things. He can sing. He can, you know, he understands mm -hmm. everything. Yeah. So I think we just have to start blocking the brain mm. from that pattern. Because yeah. if we don't, then it's going to be a huge issue. But as a last point here, I would like to know if you see this a lot or if you work that a lot with people, because now about painting in particular, I believe that this happens in every field, but it is a long road mm -hmm. and it is a hard road. Mm -hmm. It is a road that it takes consistency. Mm -hmm. And um, Elizabeth Gurry even was saying that on her as a writer that it, take, it took like 10 years. Yeah. And sometimes people get... Because again, they see in social media, these people, yeah. like, and they don't know how long it took for people to get there, right? Exactly. How long it took for that person to have 35,000 followers and sell things there. So do you get that kind of frustration and do you get people that get, are, get to you like, I'm going to give up. It's not yeah. happening yet. Yeah. Because I mean, I think we all go through that. Yes. I, I, it's funny because I've not had anyone who said that to me, but I have had on a couple of occasions, 
um, when someone said, oh, I've been doing this for so long and I haven't mm-hmm. got to where I want to be and, uh, and all these things that you've said and how difficult it is. And they're just, you know, they're completely slumped and miserable. And which I can understand because, you know, as you say, yeah. we all have days like that. And there was one, one woman I, I said it to. I said, um, if it's making you so miserable, why don't you just give it up? She went, oh, I can't give it up. And I said, why not? What's that? Why is that? Why can't you give it up? Mm. And it was about getting her back in touch with why she painted why she did her art Mm. and in her situation she was she was doing a job that she hated for about four days a week so that she can be in her studio for three days a week Mm. Um, and then she was trying really hard to sell the work she was creating on the three days I mean it's a common story and one of the first things I said is is there another job that you could do you know a job that why do you have to be doing a job that you hate for four days could you find a job that you could enjoy for those four days? While wow, you're, you're getting over. While you're, important. you know, you're mm-hmm. doing. And, and but it could, what she came down to was that she, she would be doing the art regardless of whether it sold because she had to do it. Oh, it yeah. was just, so, yeah, you know. Yeah. And it's the difference between wanting to do art and needing to do art. Um, and she decided that she, she would yeah I'll have a look at this and she looked around and she found a job that she would enjoy which was kind of loosely around art mm-hmm. um, it was running courses and getting other people to come in to deliver but it was using that idea and she could do that for four days a week that would pay all her bills so she didn't have to worry about selling art to make a living and she said what I'm going to do is I'm just going to paint for myself and I'm just going to create work. I'm not going to think about a collection or finding a gallery or I'm just going to paint for myself. And she had a studios within a, a studio block. And about three months later, she had an open studios and I went to see her and she's going really well and people are interested. And she got back in touch with me after the weekend and she said, I sold so much work this weekend because the work was being authentic. She'd come to me initially with, how do I make my work more commercial? Well, you can't really. Um, You just have to find your audience. She sold a lot of work and she decided what she would do was to put the money that she'd earned into a kind of a war chest and in a separate savings account. And she said, I'm just gonna save that money and then see how it goes. And maybe in five years time, I might've saved enough money to then become a full or try to become a full-time artist. Mm -hmm. And I think she's about four years into that. And she's, you know, got, I think she's probably got about a year and a half's money sold. So if she didn't, if she had no other money, she could live for a year and a half. And it freed her up so much because she's painting for herself. Mm -hmm. And what's happening is the people who like her work are gradually finding her. And it's still not a quick fix. It's still taking her time to, you know, write a newsletter and keep in touch with these people and say, this is what I'm doing. But she's finding the people who are liking her work are coming to her more rather than her having to go out and do all this kind of social media and always being thinking about, I'm doing something I really hate in order to do something I really love. She's now doing something, as I say, she's happy in her work life Mm -hmm. and she has this wonderful potential future. And I think it's, when I was, I was always going to be an artist. Mm -hmm. And I went to art college when I was 19 and I did a foundation course in art in graphic Mm -hmm. design, which has been so valuable on so many levels uh, for me anyway. But during, I think, the first couple of days, I realized I wanted to be an artist and everyone else there needed to be artists. You know, they always had the sketchbook. They were always looking at things in Mm -hmm. an artily kind of way, if not I mean artistic way. Whereas I was only an artist when I sat down with a piece of paper in front of me and a pencil, you know, oh yeah, I'm being an artist now. They just were artists. I was doing art. They were being art, you know, and it was really interesting. And I found that quite, I guess initially I found it quite upsetting because oh, I would always wanted to be an artist, but then I thought, no, it means that my creativity comes out in other ways. And it comes out in my coaching. It's come out in, in, I used to, tango dance and things like this so it comes out in other ways it comes out in writing a book it comes out in designing my um, instagram posts you know Mm -hmm. 
if you really, really want to create, if that is so fundamental of who you are, you will do it anyway. You will find a way of doing it. Um, I was looking at something recently, Grayson Perry, the, the, the famous uh, ceramicist, and he also does lots of programs and stuff. When he had no money, he was literally pulling things off the kitchen floor, like old straws and bit, things like that, and making 3D sculptures because he just had to create. Wow. And when you have that inside you, nothing will ever stop you. It's then just about, well, how do I make that transition to uh, not even necessarily being a full-time artist, but how do I just make sure that I always have that space to, to paint? I, I mentioned my best friend right at the beginning. Um, during lockdown, she's always said, I'm not an artist. I can't draw this or thing. And she makes, she now started watercolour painting uh, and she started doing it at the beginning of lockdown just as something to do to break up she was not furloughed she was working really hard and now she makes sure she has an hour a week where she just sits with her paint and she hasn't started learning yet she just is teaching herself and she's such a natural she's just found her medium I'm so jealous because I'm so bad at watercolors but it's that even there, she has this discipline of finding an hour a week where that's all she does. Mm -hmm. It's how do you then build this into your life in an ongoing way? And then gradually you can build up your vision of where you want to go. It's all about expectations as well, right? I think you, you had Absolutely. a quote here in your book that it's people get frustrated, but not because, you know, because something that they projected didn't work. Yeah. But it's not because the thing itself is not working. And yeah. that happens exactly. yeah. 99.9%. Yeah. yeah. It, it's the thing where we, um, uh, it's where, I mean, we want to produce something. We go, oh, I want to produce that kind of thing. And we produce something and it isn't that. It doesn't work out the way we thought. But mm -hmm. I, I've got a perfect example, actually, a stupid example in a way. This morning I was on a, a spreadsheet and I had um, a spreadsheet that had, questions a question a day oh sorry a question a week coaching question and it was a question uh, per line and I was thinking oh god you know how do I make this into a document rather than a spreadsheet without having to copy every line across mm -hmm. and I was going through all these different you know trying to find out if Apple will tell me how to do it and this kind of stuff and I couldn't make it work and I was getting really frustrated and then I did something wrong which was I copied all the lines and then, so I had like 30, 30 separate lines mm -hmm. and then I clicked into one of the other lines and went paste thinking it would then paste all the 30 lines and it actually pasted all these 30 bits in one box. So suddenly it converted it into text and it was like, that's not what I thought would happen. Oh, I thought, oh, hang on, it's worked. It's done what I wanted it to do, but a different way. And what happens so often is we go, that didn't work. Yes. And we, we close it rather than that didn't work the way I thought it was. But mm -hmm. what have I got out of it? What yeah. have I learned from that? And it's, it's, it's you know, so often we we get so into this box of this is the thing I want to produce yeah. that we don't see all the other stuff. Okay, that didn't work, but all this other stuff does. So true. And yeah. sometimes it's bigger. But it's, it's an exercise. It's an exercise. People have to realize that it's an exercise yeah. and it takes time. It is. It is. It takes and time. A word I use a lot when I'm coaching is... Um, I talk about playing with things like I, I always give people actions to go away with. We decide what actions, two or three key actions they're going to work on in between sessions. Mm -hmm. And it's to help them you know, move forward. And I always if I give them an exercise, I always say start off by doing the exercise. It's like in the book, you know, start off with doing the exercise the way it's written. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't work for you or if you think, well, if I just tweak that, it would work better for me, then do it, play with it. You know, don't, if, if you try the exercise and it doesn't work, it's not that you're wrong. It's just the exercise isn't quite right for you, but play with it and alter it and, and try things out. And I think if you use that word play, it's about if you're playing, anything could happen. 
Um, and it gives you that permission to try things a little bit differently and not yeah. worry so much about the outcome because you're just playing. Yes. You know, and yes. sometimes just do things to say, I don't know how this will work out, but I'll just do it and find out, you know, yeah. and be open to whatever happens. It's yeah, it that's, more that's the main thing. Part. We have to be open. We have to Absolutely. be open. Yeah. And so, Deborah, how people, if they don't know, if this, work with you would work for them. So how do mm -hmm. people can get it started? Do you have a free uh, call that people can just get it started and see if it's going to work for them, how that works? I do, absolutely. Um, if you go to either my website or you, know, you hook up with me on any, I'm on most of the social media. Mm -hmm. um, I'll put all the links in the notes. That's brilliant. Thank you. I have um, what's called a free, a free clarity call. It's a half hour mm -hmm. call. And it's done on Zoom, and that's a general generous it's time. A general thing, yeah. Well, I think it's important because you can explain what coaching is, mm -hmm. but I don't think you really get it until you you talked earlier about an aha moment. But it's it's actually being in the process, right? You know, and so it's not a sales call. It's about you finding out whether I'm the right person to work with, whether it mm -hmm. is what you want. Some people come thinking I'm going to be telling them what to do. Yes. Be, you know, these, it's not that at all. It's about what it is that you want to do. And in the call, we kind of identify maybe what a key, you know, what, what is it? And you can clarify about. also the kind of work you do because many people are not, never did therapy or not used to talk on something. Exactly. Exactly. And they think it's all going to be about, no, no, that's wrong. No, no. What you want to be doing is, and, and it's just about. You're not going to be teaching them how to get more followers on Instagram. Absolutely no. <laughs> Absolutely not. It's about what it is, what it is that you want. Um, I mean, obviously in half an hour, you can't work out somebody's life. Right. Completely, but it's to give an experience of coaching. Mm -hmm. At the end of that, then I, I always say during the call or at the end of the call, you know, even if we never talk again, I like to try and feel that people go away with something, perhaps right. an understanding about something. But then we can work together. And I work, I mean, I've got clients at the moment in France, in Canada, in Ireland. So this is the great thing about Zoom. You know, as long yeah. as you time zones work. I know. Um, and as long as the internet connection works, I can work with people anyway. And as long as I have I to be honest, as long as you speak English, because I do not speak any other languages. It <laughs> yes, is, of course. I just don't have a facility with languages. And then and then I also saw on Instagram that you have packages as well, right? That people can buy yeah. six. Yeah. I mean, if they like that and yeah, and you have uh, packages of sessions, right? That's right. Yeah, they're usually six. And the way I found that works for a lot of people is to have monthly sessions because then mm -hmm. that gives you, have you time, time to go away and do work. stuff. Mm -hmm. And then you get a check-in. Um, and it, I like that you also give some kind of homework. Yes. Right? You Actionable really, steps. Absolutely. Because it's... Uh, it, it, you have to get the balance. You know, sometimes you can spend a whole session talking about what is that one thing that's stopping you? But it's, and that's valuable. Mm -hmm. But it's not valuable if you're then not going to use that information and to yes. say, oh, okay, so now I understand. So that means that I could take that little step that I've been, mm -hmm. you know, scared of. And so the actions, sometimes they're only a tiny action or seemingly a tiny action, but it could be a tiny action that you haven't been taking, taking for six months. But that mm -hmm. could just give you that confidence to, you know, move forward. I mean, it's so individual. This is the thing. Sometimes it can be a big step. Um, but having that meeting up monthly, it, it, you know, it's six months. That gives you time to move projects yeah. forward. It means you know that you've got someone who is, that you can be accountable to, yes. who is on your side, who is going to say, okay, so how did you do with the action? And it's mm -hmm. not... Well, you didn't do that. What was the point? It was, okay, so why didn't action happen? Mm -hmm. What stopped you? I mean, it could have been, you know, hey, a global pandemic got in the way, but it can mm -hmm. be, oh, well, you know, well, so what stopped you? And that can, un I mean, the very fact that an action doesn't get done can sometimes unravel something else yeah. as well, you know. So, so after the clarity call, then they can do a package with you. Do you do group coaching as well or no? Just individual? 
I only do individual coaching at the moment, but mm -hmm. funnily enough, I am looking at possibly introducing group coaching next year. That would be the idea I'm thinking of is very small groups of maybe only about four people. And again, it would be monthly. Oh, that's so that exciting. you would be, um, and it can be with three other people that you know, or it can be with strangers, depending mm -hmm. how that goes. Um, I ask that because I just finished something called boot camp, and basically huh? is it was not a, I don't even know how to call <laughs> it's first of all it was deep inside for us to know how to learn the rules of composition in our mm -hmm. work, but yeah. it was not like a class. It was mm -hmm. more these are the rules, and us having to do work and homework, and then we come to discuss this group of. 10 women mm -hmm. but I tell you it was profound mm -hmm. because of the group of women because we all had different styles yeah and our struggles with the rules of composition of that moment for example it was balance and some people struggle some people not so much but our talk it was not actually recorded because it was so personal and so yeah. It was so amazing to just be there and talk about struggles or, or going geek with color and, you know, talking about balance or, you know, it was profound. There were crying, there were laughs, there were anger, yeah. you know, <laughs> I think it's, it's, mm. it's powerful. It was powerful I, to do fine. that with women. I actually miss to have that. Yeah. We would meet twice a week because, you know, it was a, for six weeks, a, a very intense thing. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I miss it. I miss yeah. to have that talks to women talking about art in a different way. Mm -hmm. Not about how can I sell or more about the art. Yes. And how we want to grow. Yeah. And I think that would be powerful also to do that in terms of self growth for us and the talk about together about our struggles and have someone directing yeah. the conversation so very yeah. exciting very exciting it, it, I think it, it's a great yeah. idea yeah and it's nice to have I, I like kind of a group of four because it means that they can get to know each other and and also because um it's you can learn from the other people in the group as well you know the whole thing of absolutely you know and, and even if it's not giving information sometimes it can just be the asking the question you know well have you thought of this or have you spoken to or uh you know, almost with other people asking the coaching question mm -hmm. so it's like as you say me like facilitating the conversation so it is mm -hmm. something i'm looking at i've done team coaching before with small teams of people mm -hmm. you know who may be doing a project together and working out kind of how to how to use the best of each person mm -hmm. to make the project work rather than trying to fit people into boxes is find out well what really are the different yes. skills and the mindsets that so it can really make this great that's when that works that's yeah. that's amazing that's really so exciting. tell people i'm going to put everything on the notes but tell people where they can find you um the best place really is my website, mm -hmm. which is uh, catchingfireworks.co.uk. I love and that name. <laughs> it came from, um, I feel that's what I do. You know, when people have lots of fireworks yes. firing up. And yes, I, that's how I like it. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, on and your the, Instagram as well. Tell people Instagram. your Instagram because you do some great posts. Oh, thank you. Um, it's at fireworks. DHP. Yeah. And if yeah. you go to the website, it mm -hmm. I'm across yes. all different social media. But so I will put there. all yeah. the links and I'll put Absolutely. also the link yeah. for the book. Thank and you. also I would say to people, I'll put also a link. I I will try to see if Instagram has a direct link, but uh Deborah participate on our, our talk twice on our that. artist friends um Instagram and it was just absolutely amazing. Um, I'm so glad that they, uh, I discover you through them. So um, I will try to see if Instagram leave me a link. If I don't, I'll put the Instagram of where the talks are so you guys can catch. And again, we're going to do a book club of Deborah's book and it's going to be really exciting. We're going to do 
a cheat sheet about the book, you know, a worksheet so you can, and we're going to dive deep into the book. And probably Deborah is going to talk with me on Instagram about the book. So many like good, that. many good things yeah. I had. Deborah, it was, uh, it is always amazing when we talk with you. It's just <laughs> absolutely a delight. I'm just, you bring every time I'm like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I love talking to artists. That's why I love my job. <laughs> yes, it must it's be amazing. Absolute joy. But I really appreciate how you give this, you know, you really, you, we can see that you really know what artists think and their struggles. It's, yeah. it's really amazing. So I really appreciate so much of being here. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm delighted for all the people that are going to listen to this. And I tell people, if you are more interested, you can also DM Deborah on Instagram. Of course, mm -hmm. if you have any questions, DM her there, message her or uh, her email. I'm going to be sure to put your email as well if yeah. people want to talk direct with you and not put comments or something like that. So if they want something more private. So Deborah, again, thank you so much for coming to the podcast. My pleasure. Lovely to talk with you as always. <laughs>